you and I haven't known each other particularly well or for very long, but I, I did get a chance to visit with you last mm. time I was in Washington. And um, I've always had a, a, a perspective about lawsuits with regard to the secular community at, at broad. And there are sometimes lawsuits that I think are a bad idea. Sure. Um, the uh, Michael Newdow's lawsuits about removing in God we trust or one, uh, from the money was, I thought, strategically bad. I don't disagree with him. I'd like to see it come off. I just think it was a strategically bad decision, but I'm not the arbiter of that. And there are a number of different organizations. There's American Atheists, there's Freedom from Religion Foundation, there's Americans United, and then there's others that aren't even necessarily secular in their goals, like ACLU or Southern Poverty Law Center and things like that. When you, you and the rest of the, the legal staff are considering what cases you should take on behalf of American atheists or on behalf of the people who are wanting American atheists to take this up. Hmm. What's the process you go through on figuring out whether or not this is a, a good idea or a bad idea? Sure. So, I mean, for m most of the process, it applies um, to every complaint we get. Uh, you know, some someone comes to us with an issue, and the first thing we do is figure out, and us it's usually pretty apparent, whether or not it is a legal issue or not. Mm -hmm. Plenty of complaints come in that are objectionable behavior that aren't legally actionable. Um, plenty of them are legally actionable but aren't the kinds of cases that we take because we deal with lawsuits that are um, – that involve the government right. um, because it's a civil rights organization. So if someone is having a dispute with their employer, we hand those off to – we direct them to the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or their state-level equivalent. Um, <clears throat> then if it's something that is legally actionable and is something – um, that is the kind of case that we would take from a broad constitutional perspective. Um, we figure out how best to approach it. Usually that starts by collecting all the information we can through FOIA requests, um, online searches, uh, basically getting all the possible information um, so that we can know the situation as best we can going in. Um, uh, then there will be a demand letter. Um, and at a certain point, there at a certain point in each case, we reach an inflection point where you have to decide. Um, it, the complainant has to decide. Okay, they're not playing ball. They're not willing to work with us to solve whatever problem we've brought to their attention. And we do think that's the best way to address these issues is to solve them through cons building constructive relationships and reaching a solution that's agreeable for everybody. In some cases, that is impossible. So the first question then is, is the complainant interested in pursuing a lawsuit? Because a lawsuit is a very long and arduous thing, even if you know, we don't charge our complainants for our services. We are you know, a nonprofit organization. We, um, you know, yeah, we don't, we don't charge them for, for legal work. Um, but it's still very stressful and still it's going to take a long time before you reach a resolution. Um, so some people choose not but there, to. But there's still money involved. I mean, it could be costly for American atheists to, to oh, actually certainly. pursue certain yes. Um, and, um, you know, we uh, often have to hire a local council to partner with. Um, and we have to, very often, the FOIA requests cost money because uh, it takes employee time at the agency to do the searches right. and, and cost of copying documents and that sort of stuff. So there are certainly costs on our end. Um, the hope is that at the end of the proceeding, if presuming you succeed, you recover virtually all of those legal fees and expenses um, under the law from the government. Which, which raises a question of something that we've seen over and over again. There are some – there are precedents that are set. So, for example, the Texas state constitution has a provision that you can't run for office unless you – believe in a higher power. However, that no longer has any teeth because of the Supreme Court decisions. Right. And, you know, we and Herb Silverman fought this uh, in North Carolina, wherever it was. Yeah, I believe so. Um, what we keep seeing is some local city council will do something that's clearly already been ruled on in a dozen other cases of we're going to slap in God we trust on our sheriff's cars or we're going to have a, a, a Christian uh, 
prayer celebration before we start work with our public employees and all these other things. Quite often, I know that uh, American Atheists, Freedom from Religion Foundation, and others will basically send them a letter uh, that I would think for reasonable people should have an impact. And that is you are engaged in something which has already been ruled on many times as being in violation of the First Amendment and marginalizing. And yet some of these people go forward with it. And on behalf of like... Let's say I live in this town. Now this town is spending my tax dollars to fight something that they've already lost before they begin. I do want to correct you on one, the, okay. the in God we trust on police cars and stuff. The courts have said that in God we trust is the national motto. And sure. so, I mean, there could be circumstances where that would be an well, issue. Or is it a Bible verse he put on? Or oh, if it's a Bible verse, then yeah. 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 I'm trying to remember exactly what happened in, uh, in, in Cleveland, Tennessee. Uh, where there was the sheriff was doing that right. uh, on the police vehicles. That was, uh, I will say that was before my time. Yeah. But yeah, I think that was um, settled before it ever got to. And that's uh, one of the yeah. problems too is that In God We Trust is since 1954 the national motto, mm. replacing E Pluribus Unum, which wouldn't have caused any lawsuits. No, far superior motto. Yeah. <laughs> superior in every way, not the least of which is that there wouldn't be so many lawsuits. And yet, so the, the court rules that because it's a national motto, okay, it gets to stay. Is there a path to, I mean, you know, is to there, addressing that at all? And is that anything that we should even be considering? Aren't the, are there bigger issues with people's civil rights being violated or um, more blatant mm -hmm. uh, encroachments? Is there a, through litigation, is there a way to challenge the motto itself? Probably not at this point because it's kind of all already been addressed. Yeah. Now, the actions of, you know, um, whether Arkansas passing a law mandating it be displayed in every school classroom and school library, um, depending on how they reach that decision, you could very much say uh, there could very well be a claim that their decision to do that was intentionally promoting religion. Um, but all you would do is accomplish them removing those displays from those right. locations. Right, not the motto itself. You're not changing yeah. what the national motto is. Yeah. Um, so the solution there is political. Um, if, you, if, if we want to change the national motto, and I know virtually everyone in the atheist, non-believer, secular community would like to see the motto changed, yeah. We have to elect members of Congress who will pass a bill that changes the motto. Sure. That's, so the way, the way we change what the, the law is is through uh, electing representatives that actually fundamentally change the law or through precedents argued essentially hopefully from the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. However, th this, 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 there's a couple of curiosities that, that I'd like to get to while you're here because sure. I, I don't often get to bend people's ear on this. Uh, the first is... I don't know what I'm in for, so... Yeah. The first is this notion that the Supreme Court has ruled on something and yet there's a contingent, you know, it's like a 5-4 decision. So even mm -hmm. nearly most of the Supreme Court justices are disputing what the ruling should be. Absolutely. How fragile is a 5-4 decision compared with a unanimous decision from the Supreme Court? Um, it, it kind of goes to how much they value precedent, but is there a, diff a major difference in precedent on a 5-4 over a, you know, 7 I mean. In terms of every court below the Supreme Court, no, there's not. I mean, every judge underneath the Supreme Court is obligated to follow right. Supreme Court precedent, no matter how big or small the majority was. Um, once you get to the Supreme Court, um, I think the five-four decisions are certainly more um, fragile. Um, so, if you if you brought a case, you appealed it all the way to the Supreme Court. Is it reasonable to assume that they're more likely to even accept a case that was based on a 5-4 precedent versus accepting a case that was on, you know, a 7-2 or, you know, an unanimous? Um, I don't know the answer to that question with any certainty. I think it's likely that they would be uh, more willing to take a case that is um, – was a closely decided decision than one where it was 9 nothing. there's no um, – no one's written a strongly worded dissent or well-reasoned right. anything at all. I, I think, um, yeah, it's much more likely that they're going to hear a case um, addressing a 5-4 issue than a unanimous issue. Yeah, because, I mean, when you go back to, like, um, 
the Supreme Court cases that happened around 2004, 2005 or so, where, if I, and I'm going to get this partially wrong, but essentially it felt like, I think it was Justice Breyer who invented a grandfather clause as saying the, the Texas one can stay because nobody really complained about it, whereas the Kentucky one has to go because uh, people complained right away, which I think was just a big message to everybody to, you need to complain. Yes, absolutely. Uh, get it on record. But... So we've got that sort of uh, of decision out there, and, and and by the way, the 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 religious sphere is the only place in which that is true. A constitutional violation of any other clause, just because no one complained about it, doesn't mean that it's not a violation. Yeah. It's only when it comes to, I guess, Ten Commandments displays and whatnot. It was a very. It was actually the very first show I did. Um, the Atheist Experience was a, a week that Jeff D. forgot to show up, and I had just written an article about those, those Ten Commandments decisions uh, and jumped in and, and sat down on the show and talked about it because I'd done quite a bit of research on it. And it was incredibly frustrating to me for somebody to say, well, because people haven't complained, we can... How, how is that relevant? And, and shouldn't it be patently obvious to somebody to say, there are good reasons why people aren't complaining, and that's mm -hmm. because they're the ones in the minority position that are specifically being kind of implicitly silenced by these sorts of things, made to feel as second-class citizens. Especially on an issue in which um, uh, there, there are certain issues um, where if a case touches on your um, private life, um, you can file a lawsuit anonymously because the courts recognize that there are certain areas where someone wouldn't want it made public that they sought an abortion sure, or that kind of thing. Um, and your religious beliefs are one of those things. So if the courts recognize that your religious beliefs can be grounds for you to not want to file a lawsuit under your own name, then surely they could recognize, but they haven't, that um, it may also be a reason that you don't want to pursue the lawsuit at all. Not because you're fine with what happened, but because you don't want the surus that would come along with it. Just wanted. You mean like not not wanting to suffer through what Christine Blasey Ford suffered through and, and sure, coming forward certainly. about stuff? Yeah, and yeah. it doesn't just apply to lawsuits, which is why I mentioned that. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you tell me exactly what's wrong with my wonderful idea, okay? Which has been shot down once before, and that's this. I would like it's not my biggest issue, but I would like to end the de facto tax free status of religious organizations. I would, I, I'm fine with them publicly applying for and receiving a tax-exempt status on the same footing that everybody else has, where sure. they, they have to open their books and they have to show that they're doing something in the File public interest. It's a, yeah. yeah, but not by default. And it seemed to me that I, a Buddhist temple here in Austin had to fight for quite a while to get tax-free status with regard to property tax because mm -hmm. they weren't recognized as a religion. And it seems that all of these religions that are getting a de facto tax status um, have to, in one way or another, be recognized by the government as a religion, as qualifying for this. Absolutely. How does that not put the government in the position of deciding what qualifies as a religion and what doesn't? And if the government is deciding what does and does not qualify as a religion, how is that not a direct violation of the First Amendment? It is. I completely agree with you. The problem is uh, twofold. Uh, if the court is going to hear your case, you have to have standing to file a claim. So you have to have shown that you were harmed, um, which is just, uh, and I don't want to waste a lot of time going into you know all the specifics of, of standing, but um, standing is one issue and the other is the remedies that courts are empowered to impose at the end of a suit. So um, number one, um, before you even bring a lawsuit, you have to find someone who's been harmed. Um, so it would be the Buddhist temple that has to go through a bunch of extra hoops to qualify. Sure. So they would have standing, right? Uh, you know, under most interpretations. I don't know about the newest justices or anything like that, but um, Sta standing is like a hot potato in recent years. So it, yeah, it absolutely is. But let's set standing aside and say that the courts say that the Buddhist temple has standing. Um, the remedy um, is what is the court going to do to correct whatever happened to the plaintiff? Um, and in that instance, the, the, the harm that happened is they had to, you know, jump through all these hoops, presumably spend money 
paying employees to respond to IRS requests or send people to meetings and whatnot. There are um, also just the constitutional harms. Um, the problem is what you do to correct it is not to say, okay, um, everyone has to file a 990 and do all that stuff because that doesn't change the situation for the Buddhist temple. The Buddhist temple, everything would be the same for the Buddhist temple. They would still have to file their 990s, get um, certification from the IRS as a 501c3. So the only, only thing the court could rule is to give Buddhists the same exemptions that others are giving? They would have to get and the— And not yeah. change the way— they, they would not say, okay, we're just doing away with the, the exemption entirely. How could you possibly get standing to show that, for example, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, as a matter of policy, is essentially violating the First Amendment and this needs to be corrected? I would argue that essentially any taxpayer whose money is paying the IRS to make those distinctions has what's called taxpayer standing. However, the Supreme Court has disagreed with my point of view um, and the point of view of a number of other people I've talked to um, in a number of cases that say you can, as a taxpayer, you have the right to file a lawsuit for violations of the Establishment Clause, but only if the expenditure of your tax money is specifically laid out by an act of Congress in a way if, – if Congress passed a law that said we are going to grant – um, name your megachurch uh, $150,000. That would be challengeable just by virtue of me being a taxpayer and some of my money is going to that. But if it's we're allotting this money to the IRS to enforce um, Section 501c3 of the tax code, nothing about that expenditure violates the Establishment Clause. It's only the discretionary side of things by the executive department or the executive branch that is um, violative. So you wouldn't have taxpayer standing. You'd have to be one of the people who is directly impacted by the actions of that executive department. It's, it's really troubling that there could be a clear policy in place which under a, a fairly straightforward and plain reading of the First Amendment would be in violation of the Constitution and yet we don't really have a way to rectify that. That's I completely agree with you. I mean, it's the same thing with the motto. How do we the get motto, you on the Supreme Court? Because <laughs> I would rather have you there than at least half the justices who are there. Now. If you want to run for president, then that's not in, <laughs> um, I have a feeling I would have a a. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know if an if an atheist judge appointed to um, the Supreme Court would have an easier go than Kavanaugh did, or uh, or a tougher go. Um, I don't know. Let's not go down that rabbit hole. I got a couple quick questions before we get to sure. calls. Uh, number one, what do people need to know about when they should contact American Atheists or some other organization about potentially raising a lawsuit? And what have you got going on right now with American Atheists? Sure. Well, um, you can contact us when you encounter um, something in your community, um, frankly, or elsewhere, um, that... Um, you think may violate um, the Constitution's um, uh, restrictions on, you know, religion influencing government um, and religion and government influencing religion. Um, a lot of a lot of my job is to um, let people know. Hey, actually, this is uh, you know, thank you for your question. Um, this isn't really a violation because right. X Y Z. Um, and I have I'm happy to send those emails. So if people see something that's questionable, absolutely bring it to me because sometimes it's actionable and sometimes it's not. Um, as far as what we have um, going on right now, we have three, three cases in active litigation right now. One in Houston where a student sat for the Pledge of Allegiance for um, reasons both religious and philosophical. And, um, and, and how is this even a thing? Didn't the, didn't the Jehovah's Witnesses already fight this? In like 1946, they fought this in a case called West Virginia Board of Education v. Barnett. I mean, it this said, is one of the ones where if, I think if you sent a letter, the school would go, yeah, we kind of screwed up here. And instead they didn't. They doubled down. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's really troubling that it's 
that it has come to this stage. Um, this is actually kind of a unique case because um, and I don't want to talk too much about it because it is inactive litigation. Sure. And I'm dealing with it tomorrow. But um, um, this is a case that involves a claim for monetary damages uh, because of uh, the, the impact that four years of bullying by students and teachers had on a student. Um, our cases usually don't involve damages just by virtue of, you know, someone imposing, you know, their religious perspective on a community doesn't generally involve out-of-pocket expenses. Um, Although I would think that maybe if a principal... I'm getting to it. Uh, if a principal uh, basically set up a, a student to be marginalized and suspended them, that can affect their academic ability, which can affect what college they can go to and what jobs they get, and so you could have this cascade. Absolutely. Though they're proving it and proving proximate cause uh, that their actions were the cause of those damages is mm. would be a challenge. Although you could probably find expert uh, expert witnesses to, to discuss the impact that it would have on a student, yeah. Um, one we recently filed just at the beginning of October is against a state senator in Arkansas named Jason Rapert, who um, has the practice of blocking atheists um, who criticize his point of view on... Um, church-state separation issues from his official social media accounts, Twitter and Facebook. Um, this is a case that's following in the footsteps of the uh, Knight First Amendment Institute's lawsuit against uh, the president over his um, implementation of his at real Donald Trump Twitter account. You, you, look, you look like you have a question, so I'm going to pause. I, I would like for you to explain this because... Um, and it may just be that I haven't fully processed this. Have we gotten to a point where somebody's Twitter account, um, even if it's like the official Twitter account of a representative, would somehow, it would be, well, I don't, I don't understand. Why can't Jason Raper block whoever he wants? Because essentially social media is the 21st century town hall. And a just as a lawmaker can't say, um, you know, uh, s uh, constituents who uh, disagree with my position can't come into my um, legislative office and and talk to me. Uh, they can't uh, or exclude them from not campaign events, but you know, legislative town halls that they hold with their constituents. Um, you can't exclude people from a conversation that y you have created a forum for in social media. Um, Can't you? Like if I did a town hall mm -hmm. and we just ran out of room, then we're excluding some people. Sure. But also if there were people who were disruptive in that town hall, we could have them removed. Absolutely. And and so I'm wondering what how something similar couldn't work. On, I mean, granted, running around just saying, hey, we're not letting black folks into my town hall. We're not letting atheists into my town hall. Yes, I get that's a problem. Um, this is this is a sticky wicket. I, I, I kind of like it. I am really looking forward to this case um, it, because it is very much the person saying, if you're an atheist, you can't come to the town hall. If you're black, you can't come to the town hall. Um, uh, and as well as after they've kicked you out of the town hall, um, bad-mouthing you at the event saying, oh, you know, we aren't allowing the atheists in because they're immoral liars and blah, blah, blah. Saying that, I guess um, the difference between Rapert and Donald Trump is that Donald Trump will let you show up and bad-mouth you while you're standing there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to a certain extent, yeah. Um, essentially, the government, by, by creating an official Facebook page for his Senate office, he's creating a limited public forum. And you can't exclude people from a limited public forum based on viewpoint. It's hmm. not... A conventional limited public forum, like a um, you know town hall or what have you, but um, but it is the high tech modern version of the limited public forum, and um, I personally I think the law is pretty clear cut, and there's no reason to say that it doesn't apply on social media just as much as it applies in a city council meeting. Yeah, it kind of gets down to you know the changing definitions of you know what's a forum and. Even in some cases, the difference between like opt in and opt out, or whether we're broadcasting information. So it's like mm -hmm. he can't block somebody from visiting his web page to see his announcements. And so he can make a case that, well, everything I'm saying there that's public policy that's important is going up on the website, so everybody has access to it. Right. Um, but other people are ha other people are able to comment on and respond publicly to his statements or posts or what have you. Um, 
and people with contrary views are excluded from doing the same. Yeah. Man, I, I'm, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay focused on this uh, as time goes on because I find this incredibly interesting on a number of fronts about, you know, what are the limits of free speech and, you know, Instead of blocking everybody, I could just ignore every atheist who posts. Um, right. Facebook has the, if, uh, Twitter has the capacity to mute a user that doesn't prevent them from seeing your tweets and and engaging in conversation. You just would not see that person's conversation. Yeah. Um, so that that functionality is there. He just chooses not to use it, and instead in excludes people from the conversation entirely. Hmm. Now, now I'm even more intrigued because I was only passingly familiar with what happened. And there's, a, you know, the, the de facto thing in my head is, okay, it's his Twitter thing. It's not the only way people have access to him or his information. And, you know, I don't owe anybody, even as a representative. Like if, I, if I'm elected to represent somebody on city council, that doesn't mean that I have to have an open door policy where they can come in and talk to me whenever they want. Um, I just happen to be open to engaging on equivalent grounds. That's right. I can't the discriminate. The restrictions have to be neutral. Yep. Yeah. Which, you know, I would just shut my door. None of my constituents can show up ever. None of you get to talk to me. It's just all, you can say, send me an email. Send me a handwritten letter. Handwritten letters stamped through the U.S. Postal Service are the only viable means of communicating with me. You would be entitled to do that. Really? Even as though it's a financial as... burden on people for stamps? Um, yeah, I think so. Because, um, I mean, even coming to City Hall places a burden on you and your time and... Effort and that it's, mo it's more money in gas than it is for a stamp. Probably. Yeah. For, for now. For now. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming down. If you, if you want to, uh, how, how do people get a hold of you at American Atheists? So I can be reached at legal at atheists.org. That's A T H E I S T S dot O R G. Um, yeah. Send, send them there. Go to atheists.org slash violation and you can report a violation that you have. Violation. Encounter. In fact, I'd prefer if you see something that's potentially a violation that you do it that way because we have a specific method for cataloging all of the complaints we receive and it's much easier to do if they all come in through one portal. Yeah, you, you and Allison and others are doing great work for people. So let's try and make it easy. So use the violation submission thing if you think you have something that's suspected and Jeff will do his best to get back to you. You're ready to Don't message me on Facebook because those are not uh, – I'm seriously suspicious of the confidentiality of Facebook messages. I'm totally messaging you on Facebook now all the time. No, don't do it with legal issues. I'll direct you to my email address. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. It's all right. At least I know who my friends are because And <laughs> Andrew will answer me.